the 10th chapter, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And we'll begin our reading in the 12th verse together. Romans chapter 10 and verse number 12. Often this is connected with what we would call the Romans road, uh, which is a pathway through the book of Romans to help someone acknowledge their condition with God and to bring them to a place of faith and trust in the Lord for their salvation. And Romans chapter 10 is often quoted uh, within that pathway of the Romans road. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 12, the Bible says this, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation will I anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gain saying people. I want us to notice, if we could, the expression that we find in the 21st verse. The Bible says this, I have stretched forth my hands. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be able to gather together, Lord, and to escape all of the pressures and all of the uh, burdens of the world and to focus our attention on you. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to turn our eyes upon Jesus in this very hour. I pray that you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray, Lord, that you would allow your word, the seed of your word, to fall on the good ground of our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified with our response to your word this morning. I pray, Lord, that you would hide me behind the cross. I pray you'd give me the words to say. Take from my mind that which you would have me not to say. I pray, Lord, that you'd be glorified with our message this morning. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe that there are many wonderful things in the Bible that we will probably never understand this side of heaven. But I also believe that there are many things in the Bible that we can definitely know, that we can know. And I'm glad this morning that we can know that God loves the world. You say, Pastor Burns, how do we know that? Well, because that's what the Bible says. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. God so loved the people of the world. The Bible says that he gave his only begotten son. And Jesus bled and died so that we could have a home in heaven and that we can be reconciled to God. Romans chapter 5 and verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. And the salvation of a soul is found in the gospel. 
the gospel. Jesus Christ died for our sins and he was, ro- he was buried and rose again the third day. The good news, the gospel. I read about a small boy who was considerably late coming home from school every day. And his parents warned him one day that he must be home on time that afternoon, but instead the boy arrived later than ever. And his mother met him at the door and she said nothing. And at dinner that night, the boy looked at his plate and all that was there was a slice of bread and some water. And he looked at his father's full plate of food, meat and potatoes, and his father just was silent, didn't say a word. The boy was crushed at this. And the father waited for the full impact to sink in, and and then he quietly took the boy's plate, and he placed it in front of himself, and he took his own plate full of meat and potatoes, and he put that plate in front of the boy, and he smiled at his son. And later on, as that boy grew up and grew to be a man, he said, all of my life, of what I've known that God was like, he says, I learned it from my father that night. You see, that is the very heart of God. I hope we understand that. And that is the glorious message of the gospel in 2 Chronicles, uh, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 says, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. This is indeed the eternal message of God. This is the message that is being preached throughout the world today, the message that many have given their own lives so that people groups could hear about the love of God, missionaries leaving their homes and their families and standing before a people that they do not know, a people that may not even like them, yet declaring the very message of God. And it is the message that I stress to you today. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled with God. Come the way of the cross. And so do you know Christ today? Do you know that heaven is indeed your eternal home? Do you know for sure that your sins are forgiven? Now, it is true, absolutely true, that the devil is fighting against this gospel message. The devil wants to confuse people. He wants to carry people away with lives. He wants to conquer people. The devil doesn't want you this morning to be reconciled with God. The devil doesn't want you to have hope. The devil wants you to be lost. He wants you to be in darkness and separated from your creator. And this is what Paul is stressing. He's teaching and preaching on in this incredible chapter. He's writing to his kin people of the flesh, the Jews. In chapter 9, we see his heart for this people that he could wish himself a, a curse from Christ for his brethren. And and he wants his people to know the truth. His heart is broken because they had rejected the God of the Bible. Paul wanted Israel to know God and be free from the bondage of religion and the law. He wanted them to have, as he enjoyed, a real dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. And so he writes this powerful message in verse 12 of our text, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And then we have this powerful truth, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I'm glad today I'm a part of that whosoever. You are also a part of that whosoever. If you accept the message of the gospel, you can be a part of that whosoever and you can enjoy the wonderful salvation that is found in Jesus Christ. And so let's look at Romans 10 for a moment here and contextually look at what Paul is teaching. First of all, can we notice if you're taking notes, would you write it down, the preacher, the preacher, The heart of what Paul, of course, is declaring is simplistic. The gospel is for all. It is for everyone. Those who hear the gospel and those who respond to the gospel and call 
out to God for salvation according to the authority of the word of God, the Bible says they will be saved. But how do they believe, Paul said, if they have never heard? And how shall they hear, Paul says, unless someone preaches the message? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So God sent people into the world with the message. The Bible says how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And they were dispensed into the world. And throughout all the Bible we read about these preachers who stand in the gap. These preachers who stand in the very stead of God and the very place of God, those who would not back down, those who would not retreat, those who were bold in their God. And we read about prophets. We read about a man named John the Baptist. We read about the disciples of Jesus. We read about the human penman here in Romans, a man named Paul, the apostle, a man named Peter. We read about James and John, and throughout the history of the church, we see various preachers of the gospel. If you turn with me to the book of Acts and the 8th chapter together, Acts chapter 8, and notice what the Bible says in verse number 31. Acts chapter 8, in verse number 31, sent from the church in Jerusalem, we read about Philip the evangelist. And in Acts chapter 8, in verse number 31, the Bible says, and he said, how can I accept some man should guide me, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a a lamb dumb before her shearers, so he opened not his mouth. And the Bible says in verse 34, and the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And the Bible says in verse 35, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. He gave to him, this man, the gospel, a preacher of the gospel. I think of way back in the the Old Testament of a man named Noah. The New Testament says that Noah is a preacher of righteousness. And for 120 years, 120 years, he preached of the coming judgment of God. I think about the preacher. Secondly, would you write this down? Can we think about the perishing? The perishing. Now, unfortunately, people don't always accept the gospel message. The Bible says in verse 16 of our text, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who have believed our report? Now, it's interesting as we understand who Paul is writing to. He's writing to Jews, and and this passage of Scripture, this quotation is from Isaiah chapter 51. And if you are a Bible student, you are also familiar with Isaiah 51 as the prophet is giving here in the Old Testament the the gospel, it's presenting Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter 51. And so in Isaiah chapter 51, we see in this passage of scripture a presentation of the gospel. And of course, it's the responsibility of each person to respond to that truth, to believe the report that is given. God sent his prophets to the Jews and they cried out to his people. They presented the Lord Jesus, and we even see in the book of Isaiah the question that is asked, who will believe our report? Jesus, I believe, illustrated this in the book of Matthew in the seventh chapter. He illustrated it with two pathways. One pathway is a narrow way, and the other pathway is a broad way. And the Bible says there are many on the broad road that leads to destruction, but the narrow road, it leads to life everlasting. Paul told the church at Ephesus that we are by default on that broad road in Ephesians chapter 2, and 
Paul said in Ephesians 2 that we're following the very pathway set out by the devil himself and how it must break the heart of Almighty God for those who would reject his provision, for those who would turn away. Can we turn to the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 3 in our Bibles together? 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. And notice what the Bible says, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 in the ninth verse. The Bible says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There are those today, sadly, that are indeed perishing. There are those today in our world who have rejected the very message of Almighty God. They have turned away from the gospel. But I want to remind you this morning that the heartbeat of God is that they would turn to him, that they would choose to believe the report, that they would trust in him for salvation. I see the the perishing. I see the the preacher, but can you write this down, the pathway, the pathway. So the Bible says in our text in verse 17, so then, look at it together, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by, say it together, the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing. Isaiah said they have not all obeyed our report. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is hearing the report. This is hearing the report. And this message, this report comes from the word of God. John chapter 3 in our Bibles in verse number 5. Let's look at this together. John chapter 3 in verse number 5. John, the third chapter, the fifth verse. John chapter three and verse number five. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, John, the third chapter, the fifth verse, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, water is a physical birth, the spirit is a spiritual birth, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now, we see that Jesus is defining these. He's defining these. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, born of the water. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. This is a spiritual birth. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. You must be born spiritually. The wind bloweth where it listeth, verse 8, And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou not a master of Israel? Aren't you one of the great teachers in Israel? And yet you knoweth not these things, Nicodemus? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. It's pretty hard for an unsaved person to lead someone to Jesus if they've never accepted Christ as their Savior. Now they can quote the Bible But Jesus said, Nicodemus, don't you understand these things? Don't you know these things as a teacher in Israel? He says in verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Jesus did not come into this world to judge sin. No, he came into this world that we might be saved from our sin. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now notice the judgment here in verse number 19. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The Bible teaches us that opportunity was given. The pathway was presented. The report was given to the Jews. In verse number 16, we see in John that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man also be lifted up. And the same who comes to Jesus, the Bible says, will have wonderful salvation and be saved. This is the pathway. But I want us to notice also, if we could, number four, the problem. Now, what is Paul establishing in this text? He's establishing not that there's a problem with the gospel. He's establishing is not that there was a problem with the preacher. He's establishing is not that they weren't sent. He says, but they rejected the gospel. They said no to the gospel, a a message so sweet, a message so amazing, a message so wonderful. Paul cannot comprehend why would they turn away. And so in his own reasoning, Paul is answering his own question, and he's saying, oh, I know what it must be. In verse number 18, I know the problem. They didn't hear the message. The reason why they reject it is because it has to be they, they haven't heard. In verse 18, but I say, have they not heard? And he answers his own question, yea, verily their sound went into all the earth. Yes, they heard. <laughs> they heard the gospel. Their sound is gone into all the earth. Their words unto the end of the world. Oh, the preachers went. And the preachers preached, but they rejected the message. And they killed the messengers. And they lived their life without God and created idols and created their own religion and continued to live a life without God. And oh, how God desired to walk with them. And oh, how God desired to have a relationship with them. And so Paul was trying to understand. He says, oh, they they probably didn't hear. Oh, no, they heard. And, And then he says in verse 19, well, maybe they just didn't have the opportunity. And so he says in verse 19, but I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, verse 19, will... I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Surely then, Paul says, it must be about opportunity because they probably just didn't have the opportunity because if they had the opportunity, they they would have believed the report. But there was opportunity. And Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are of no people. Can we turn to the book of Deuteronomy and the 32nd chapter here this morning? Deuteronomy chapter 32. And notice what the Bible says. Paul is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 32. And notice what the Bible says here in chapter 32 and verse number 21. They are moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. 
They had turned to idolatry. And the Bible says that God says, I will provoke jealousy in their heart by turning to a people that is not a people at all. And that's the Gentiles that he's talking about. No people. He, he's saying this is an unworthy people. This is a foolish people who are void of understanding. In fact, in verse 20 of our text here in Romans chapter 10, look, but Isaiah is very bold. I think it's important for a preacher to be very bold. Would you think that is true? And the prophet is very bold, and look what he says. I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. As the gospel had come to the Gentiles, a people who didn't seek after God and a people that didn't ask for God. Jesus spoke of the Gentiles in his own ministry in John chapter 10. Would you turn there? The gospel of John in the 10th chapter, if you would. John chapter 10. And notice what the Bible says, if we could, in verse number 16. John chapter 10, in verse number 16. Jesus said this, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. That speaks of the Jewish nation. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. That speaks of the Gentiles there. I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. What is Paul saying in Romans chapter 10? He's saying that the gospel is for everyone. And, and there's equal opportunity for people to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. They heard the message of the gospel. They had opportunity to accept the message of the gospel. But they did not believe the report. But I want us to notice my last point, number five here, and this is so important, and that is the patience of God here. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 21, but to Israel he saith, this is God, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. You know, that one verse tells us a lot about God and the nature of God toward Israel, but also to the Gentiles. You see, God stretched out his hand to a people who were disobedient and a people who were gainsayers. Why? Why? Because he loves them. Now listen to me. I know that not everyone's going to believe the gospel. We, we, we are commanded not to save people. We're, we're commanded to preach the gospel. We give people opportunity to respond. And the Spirit of God works in their heart. We are co-laborers with God. And, you know, we water or we plant the seed. But it's God that gives the increase. And we are busy presenting the gospel. But we also understand that God is a patient God. He is a long-suffering God. It is the very nature of Almighty God in His long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to Him. In Romans 5.8 it says, But God commended His love toward us. Now I want us to notice this. In verse number 8 of Romans 5, would you look at that verse with me? God commended or God showed his love toward us. And look what the Bible says in verse number 8. I've underlined it in my Bible. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want us to think about our position for just a moment. We were yet sinners. We were unlovable. We were lost. Hey, listen, we were a disobedient people. Now, I know contextually that this is speaking to the Jews, but I want us to notice, if we could, Ephesians chapter 2, because Ephesians chapter 2 is not 
writing here. It's not contextually written to the Jews. It's written to the Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 2. And I want us to notice in verse number 1 what Paul said to the church at Ephesus in the very first verse, he said, And you have he quickened, or made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also you had our conversation in times past and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And you say, well, what is the answer in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1 and verse number 3? Yeah, we were separated from God. Yeah, we were sinners. Yeah, we were a disobedient people. But the next verse says, but God. In other words, think about this. God stretched out his hand to us. Because he loved us. He demonstrated his love to us while we were yet sinners. And so we notice in this scripture here our position, but can we also notice his patience that he is long-suffering and his arm is outstretched and he wants us to come to him and he, 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 he desires that we would come to him. And so the opportunity for salvation, the the opportunity to be saved is today. It is now. The hymn writer said, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Patiently, Jesus is waiting and watching, is watching for you and for me. Come home, the hymn writer said, come home. Ye who are weary, come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. He's calling, O sinner, come home. And so the message is this. Would you come to the Lord this morning? But let me, let me bring this to a conclusion this morning. First of all this, if you're a Christian, would you commit in being a preacher of the gospel? Would you commit in telling other people about Jesus, whether that's at your workplace, whether that's with your family, whether that's in the community, would you be an ambassador for Jesus Christ? But secondly, if you're not a Christian today, would you come to Jesus? He's done everything possible to save your soul today. And all you have to do is come to him and to receive with your heart the message of the gospel because he has stretched out his hands to you and those hands are nailed scarred and he loves you so. Would you put your faith and trust in him? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for...